You can't give you a Hi, good right. afternoon, everyone. Um, it is my, oops, my pleasure and my honor to uh, introduce Susan Minot this afternoon. Susan Minot is an award-winning novelist, short story writer, poet, and screenwriter. Her first novel, Monkeys, was published in a dozen countries. Her novel, Evening, was a worldwide bestseller and became a major motion picture. She teaches at New York University and lives with her daughter in New York City on North End, excuse me, lives with her daughter in New York City and on North Haven Island in Maine. Um, as I'm sure you know, her most recent novel is 30 Girls, and that's the novel we will be discussing this afternoon. Um, I thought I would share just a very small sampling of the praise that 30 Girls has uh, earned. The New York Times book review called 30 Girls a novel of quiet humanity and probing intelligence, while the Boston Globe described the novel as clear and searing, pulls you in from the first page, a book that looks hard at trauma, love, and humanity. And NPR said, extraordinary, panoramic, poetic. Please join me in welcoming Susan Minot. Hi, thank you for, I know, um, we're starting late. Um, I was, I came up from New York this morning and um, took a bus to Boston and stopped at my sister's house and had, you know, two hours of drive and, and a very nice uh, driver. Um, and I sat in traffic for like 40 minutes going into Boston and I thought, no, 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 we better do something different here. So we took a different route and we got here in time, so I apologize. Um, I feel very at home being here in New England. Um, you all know how to pronounce my name, which makes me feel particularly welcome. Um, and I, it's just a, the, the light of New England feels very uh, familiar and welcoming to me, even though others think it might be stark and raw. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I came to write this book, um, since I may not look like I'm a, well, and I'm not, um, a native of Africa. Um, and then I'll read you a few um, parts of it, and then Laura and I will talk. So this, this the origin of this book um, came, and this sounds very unlikely, when I went to a dinner party in New York City in a well-appointed loft of some uh, journalist friends of mine. And they were hosting um, a group of human rights um, people who had um, their big benefit the next night. So it was just a quiet Sunday night dinner of maybe a dozen people. Um, and being honored at the banquet the next day was a woman who had done some um, uh, important work in Uganda. And at the end of the dinner, she told the story of, of her involvement in a cause. And she told a story, she was in her, her name was Angelina Item. She was in her 40s wearing kind of a flower dress and, and she spoke very calmly and sort of deliberately um, telling this sort of horrendous story about um, children being kidnapped from uh, girls from a boarding school in northern Uganda run by Italian nuns. Um, there were many elements of that already that were surprising to me. Um, though the fact of the horror of the story was the most striking thing. She said that there was a group called, this was in 1997. She said there was a group called the Lord's Resistance Army run by 
a man named Joseph Kony, who had been terrorizing the north of Uganda, which was a very poor agrarian area. And these, um, they, they call themselves rebels, but I prefer to call them bandits, since they weren't really trying to overthrow the government. And it wasn't really a civil war, though there was a lot of violence. They would raid these small villages, steal the children, kill the parents, and then sort of enslave the children, the girls, as wives to the commanders, the boys to sort of carry their thing, just to enlarge, as Joseph Coney, who was this sort of cult leader like Nutt, said to make his family larger. There was sort of no more of a um, um, goal than that. And so this woman sang this, this night at the uh, school. They had heard that the rebels were nearby, so they bolted the girls inside the dormitory. And sure enough, in the middle of the night, the guard came and knocked on, on one of the nuns' doors and said, Sister, they are here. And they could hear the noise of the rebels and the nuns having no um, guns or a way to defend themselves all hid in in a garden nearby and waited till the sound of this attack quieted down. They, they ran out and found that the, um, the rebels had banged not the door down but a window, um, chipped it away, pulled it out and used the grating as a ladder to climb up. And they, they went in and, and cleared the dormitory out of all the girls. Um, one of the nuns, a uh, woman named Sister Raquel, who's very small and slight, she, she said, well, I, I must go after my girls. So she and another teacher followed at around dawn at this point, um, finding little candy wrappers or a piece of clothing that had been dropped through this sort of maze of little paths um, to catch up to the girls. And sure enough, at noon um, the next day, she caught up with them. Um, I'm going to pause in that part of the story for now and finish it later and go back to the dinner party where everyone was sort of staring down at their plate and not really eating anymore. And someone said to Angelina Item, um, do we know this is going on? Which, of course, <laughs> answered itself. Um, no one had heard of Joseph Coney, at least not the general public. Not in the same way, for instance, that, that the world knew very quickly about the kidnapping of the girls by Boko Haram in Nigeria when it happened a year ago, um, just a little over a year ago, because there was a different kind of communication set up and there was a worldwide outcry. Well, um, Joseph Kony went on to terrorize the North for another 12 years, so there was 20 years in all that these children were subjected and, and their parents to this kind of violence. Someone else at the table said, and, and your involvement here is? And she said, well, my daughter was one of those girls. <laughs> and she was still, and it had been about a year, with the rebels. And she was here to try to raise attention um, to uh, the what was going on there. Um, at the time, I had been spending some time in East Africa. I had been there traveling. I'd written some um, stories uh, going on safari. I'd written some stories about um, someone who was trying to save the rainforest there, sort of more environmentally, excuse me, oriented stories. But I was returning, and I thought, maybe I can write something about this. It, it struck me so much, and I don't doubt that the fact that, the, that I was hearing it from this woman herself 
was one of the reasons why it struck me so much. And we often hear things and we think, oh my God, that something must be done, or I really want to help, or I want to do something. And then maybe the, the, the terrain just isn't there to follow up on it, or you're not quite sure how one does help these things. But in this case, sort of one thing led to another and I was returning to East Africa and I thought maybe I'll try to write something and it wasn't my usual um, uh, subject and I certainly wasn't a, um, a journalist who knew exactly how to write this kind of story but I thought I'd use that in my favor and I, I pitched a story saying I want to write about this but as a non-journalist would write about it. <laughs> um, sort of a back-ass way of saying, I don't know what I'm doing, but they, they sort of, um, they, they, they bought it. Um, make a long story short, the story ended up, I went over there, I spoke with Sister Raquel, who was an amazing woman, I visited the, the school where these children had been taken, I interviewed other children who had returned because this is such a slipshod kind of operation that children escape very easily, um, not in terms of danger. If they're caught, they're killed, as an example, but they you know, can sort of run off into the bush when they're supposed to be going to the bathroom or so. So a lot do return. And I spoke with a lot of those children and, of course, was um, not struck, but but taken up with the um, worry of how these children live on. They they survived, but now what? You know, they 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 went through a lot of very traumatic things, and how do they live on after that? Um, so I published this article and it was, I would say, the first time that I had written something that I actually, you know, wanted to press into someone's hands and say, you really should hear about this when I write a novel. I don't press it into anyone's hands. I'm like, you really? You really want to? I'm not sure. Um, I, I sort of write in the spirit that I read books, which is if they sort of, they, when they happen my way and I really like them, I, I stay in them and I'll, I'll, I'll finish them. And I sort of, I guess I offer my fiction in that same spirit. If, you're, if you like how this story is being told and interests you, just then, then keep reading it. But the story of the girls of Aboke and the victims of Joseph Kony was something that something needed to be done about. So I, I was sort of perched to wait to hear people say what's going on here and this has to be stopped and I think it's safe to say I heard nothing. I barely can remember anyone saying they even read the article. And it was actually, it was in McSweeney's magazine, which is not high profile, but it was, it was chosen it for an anthology, best travel stories of whatever, 2001. So it was out there, it wasn't like it was, but, and I thought, oh well, maybe that's part of the journalistic despair you accept, that you do your bit and, and you don't hear anything, and, I, my life continued on and I, I got married and I had a child and I moved to a small island in Maine so I had different concerns and I, I hadn't been writing, um, I wasn't working on a book for a long time, for about seven years um, and when I decided that I would mainly because I needed to pay the rent. <laughs> Best reason to write a book. And uh, I had a number of um, ideas for books, but I have to say those, the faces of these girls and their story and the fact that it was still going on over there 
made their story much more compelling to me. So I thought, okay, I know a little bit more for writing um, fiction. Maybe I can write a story that will sort of tell this story more from the inside so that you kind of can inhabit the world of these people and, and it's not about the facts, hearing the facts to, to sort of um, make you connect with them, but you actually do connect by experiencing their life in some way. So um, the book took me a long time to write. It took me seven years. Um, that was partly because, as I said, I did have a daughter. Um, it was my first book published in 12 years, and my daughter was 12 when it was published. Though, at, at one point, <laughs> I was saying, uh, my book, first book in 12 years, my daughter's 12, and she called out from the other room. She said, stop blaming me <laughs> for why you haven't written a book. So, fair enough, my choice, but it did line up that way. <laughs> Um, so I initially was going to write only about the Ugandan girls. I, I specifically wanted to focus on girls. I think there's, there's a little bit of um, more about boys in Africa. <laughs> um, boys, more about boys in world literature, I would say. So, so that, that was important to me. And, um, instead of just saying, here's this horrible, tragic thing going on, um, that doesn't take too much exploration. I mean, a very little goes a long way when you're describing violence. You can make a, a point very quickly. So that's not something I wanted to describe. I certainly wasn't interested in trying to understand the psychology of the LRA and how someone would become part of a cult and need to feel strong and, and, and that. That's, that's interesting, but I was interested in these girls and how the ones who survived made it or didn't. Or, in a, in a larger context, how we deal with trauma. Um, at the same time, I did want to tell this specific story. I wanted it to be about um, this conflict in Uganda, a place that I knew not well, but what I knew of it, I felt very strongly. It's a, 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 the time I've spent in Africa has been very moving to me. And I could see whenever I came back to America, people's kind of confusion about Africa, like, mm, I'm not sure, I'm, I guess I'm supposed to know, but I don't really, and I can't keep it straight, and, you know, it's, it's a huge continent, and there are many, um, many countries there, so it's not something that you're required to keep straight, and, and I, I think it pushes people away from, from being just naturally interested. So that was another reason I wanted to, to sort of make that bridge between um, a, an experience that may seem like it's too foreign to ever grasp, but I think that people, um, I think there's no experience that's too foreign for anyone to grasp. I think we're empathetic creatures, and if we concentrate, we really can imagine what it's like for someone else. And that's part of what, um, what literature can help us do. So I'm going to read um, most of, so it was going to be just about, about the Ugandan girls. And then I realized three different stories of sort of brutal struggle um, might be more than then even if I'm not pressing a book into someone's hands, just even ask someone to sort of uh, um, subject themselves to that. So I was very aware in writing this book of not um, punishing the reader as I was trying to convey a very kind of punishing and um, hard to 
digest situation. So I added an American girl character, and, um, and she's the writer who goes over to investigate the story. And once I had set up those two stories, along with Esther, the Ugandan um, character that I created, um, Esther, who has returned after being with the rebels for two years, and she's in a rehabilitation camp, which is a very loose kind of gathering of the returned children, um, overseen by one or two counselors, uh, and they draw pictures of what they've been through, and at least have some kind of feeling that there's there's uh, um, a passage that they might go through before they return to their family. Um, I began to see, um, look at the different experience that Jane, the American, was having with Esther. Um, on, in theory, absolutely different, um, and in fact, absolutely different. But I wanted to have Jane's less high stakes struggle uh, be side by side with Esther's very high stakes struggle. You know, she was living a life where she didn't know whether she would live or die, where she was repeatedly raped, where she was made to kill other children. Jane had more privileged struggles, but she's had a, a marriage to a drug addict who has died. She's suffering after that. So they're, they're different, but um, suffering to the person who's doing it or the struggle to make your life uh, have meaning, um, to forgive yourself for things you have done that you're not proud of, um, is relative to each person's experience. And even if you're not kidnapped by a bandit group, um, that doesn't mean that your struggle, whatever it is, isn't uh, just as difficult for you. So that was another thing I hadn't started out to write about that the book also became about. So I'm going to read you a little bit of Jane, I'll read you a little bit of Esther, and then I'll read you the end of that story of the kidnapping. This is Jane. She's traveling with a group of, um, of white Africans, and they're visiting a lot of free spirit Bohemian types on their way to um, the north to meet some of the, the victims. Um, but they're having kind of, uh, you know, they're dancing and having dinners and lots of people are sleeping with each other. <laughs> she woke early, there, she's, right, she's in Uganda, she's, they're, they're still in the south, staying with some friends. There was the milky cast of a mosquito net. Where was she? That's right, a new place to avoid waiting again for Harry, the young uh, man that she's having an affair with, to roll in her direction or not, she got up. The house was quiet, someone had made coffee and she smelled, followed the smell into the kitchen. There were dishes in a tiny sink. A narrow window looked out on a gigantic lawn to the lake reflecting an orange sunrise across the horizon. She heard Daphne's voice out the back door and saw her talking quiet. This is their host, a young woman with a baby. She keeps seeing women with babies wherever she goes, and she is single without a baby, so it's something that strikes her. <laughs> to the baby as she hung laundry in the line, she had probably been up for hours already. The new mother led a life parallel to others. Jane thought of her sister back home, who inhabited her role with a placid, focused air, and of her husband with a manner to match. She saw that Marion, her sister, had a capacity for attachment and had tried to mimic it, but it did not penetrate some hard core. Jane's attachments to people turned out to be more intermittent, not entirely there. Perhaps it was herself 
never entirely there. Jane took a book and a cup of coffee out to the front lawn and sat on a dewy chair. She stared at the water of Lake Victoria beyond the grass. The lake drained of blue as the sun rose and the color was pulled into the sky. Behind her were gentle kitchen sounds and the smell of toast. She pictured Harry still sleeping. He was making beautiful moments for her. And wasn't that all one got anyway? Moments? She had a shameful awareness, awareness which she managed mostly to hide from herself, that her connection to the world came only in a string of moments. Might she hope for more? She opened her book to read about the Lord's Resistance Army. She felt like a plastic white chip in an ancient forest and asked herself again just what she was doing here in a place she'd never been, going to report on a place she didn't know about, with struggles she could only begin to imagine. How did she find herself here? Fact is, she'd made a choice each step of the way. It was how a person arrived anywhere with one deliberate step after another. And this is Esther. Esther is told in the first person. She's describing being at the rehabilitation center. No one here is at ease. We are all troubled. The boys especially are fighting many times, but the girls are mean also. I saw Holly stomp a chicken yesterday. And Janet, before, she would not have hit her baby. When she saw me looking at her baby as she cried, she said, what is this compared to what the rebels did? Nurse Nancy tells us we are coming out of it. The counselors have us think that after a while, you will stop coming out of it and be as you were yourself again. I think I will be coming out of it forever. There's a person inside me who has been very bad and does not deserve a chance at life. She has done things no good person would do. I might argue against that and say, no, I am Esther. I am a good person, as good as I can be. But another voice is stronger, and that voice says, it would be better if I were dead. They tell us, you are back, and things will get better. Again and again they say, you are the fortunate ones. We say it ourselves. It might be so, but that first night lying on the ground before sleep, when I, the first night with the rebels, I asked myself, how did we get here? Your life is your own one moment, then suddenly it changes and belongs to someone else. In the past, I have felt as if my life belonged to someone else, but that was for love. I felt my life leave me and belong to his life. I liked that belonging. I chose it. Later, however, I learned it might not be so good to belong that way either. People interfere with your life and decide things for you, and then your body develops an angry feeling unsettling to your stomach. The first days are still vivid for me. I would not be sorry to forget them, but so far they stay. Things latch onto you and are not so easy to unlatch. You may try to forget, but forgetting happens without your trying when you no longer care. None of us knew how long we might be with the rebels, if we would live or die. For myself, I tried to keep a calm place inside me, this place I thought of as my soul. I pictured it in the shape of a white marble bowl. No one could disturb that bowl. It was old and curved and the one and only property only mine. I would keep that white bowl in my mind. I used to think God sat in that shallow bowl. Now. I do not know it. And 
in this last part. It's um, a few pages. Um, the nun I uh, fictionalized in my book as Sister Julia um, has caught up with the rebels and there's a commander who uh, she doesn't know if she's going to be, you know, cut down with his machete, but he, he tells her to come close and, and holds up his rosary out of his pocket. And the, the, um, the rebels have, uh, they have rosaries and they pray to Christ, but they also bow to Mecca. They also smear oil on their chests and then the bullets don't hit you or there's a certain rock you throw and suddenly it turns you into a mountain. And so a lot of weird superstitions and kind of religious combinations of things. So she's um, allowed to come, come join them. And they walk along together. She sees all the girls tied up with, with ropes and they're told not to, not to look at her or that they will kill. The, they, the girls are told that the rebels will kill Sister Julia if, if they look at her. After several hours, they came to a wooded place with huts. It looked as if farther along there were other children and other rebels. She saw where her girls were led and allowed to sit down. Captain Laguerre brought Sister Julia to a hut and sat there on a stool. There was one guard with a gun who kept himself a few feet away from Laguerre. This rebel wore a shirt with the sleeves cut off and a gold chain and never looked straight at Laguerre, but always faced in his direction. He was about 10 years old. During the walk, they had talked about prayer and about God, and Sister Julia learned that Laguerre's God had some things not in common with her God, but Sister Julia did not point this out. She thought it best to try to continue this strange relationship. Would Sister Julia join him for tea and biscuits? Captain Laguerre wanted to know. She would not refuse. A young woman in a wrapped skirt came out from the hut carrying a small stump for Sister Julia to sit on. It was possible this was one of his wives, though he did not greet her. At the edge of the doorway, she saw a hand and a half face looking out. Tea, he called. The woman went back into the hut and after some time returned with a tray and mugs and a box of English biscuits. They drank their tea. Sister Julia, who had been walking since dawn, was hungry, but she did not eat a biscuit. I ask you again, she said, will you give me my girls? She didn't phrase it as a question. He smiled. Do not worry, I am Mariano Laguerre. He put down his mug. Now you go wash. Another girl appeared, this one a little younger, about 20 with bare feet and small pearl earrings. She silently led Sister Julia behind the hut to a basin of water and a plastic shower bag hanging from a tree. She must have been another wife. Sister Julia washed her hands and face. She washed her feet and cleaned the blisters she'd gotten from her wet sneakers. She returned to Mariano. This rebel commander was now Mariano to her, as if a friend. He still sat on his stool, holding a stick and scratching in the dirt by his feet. She glanced toward the girls and saw that some of them had moved to a separate place to the side. Mariano didn't look up when he spoke. There are 139 girls, he said, and traced the number in the dirt. That many, she thought, saying nothing. More than half the school. I give you, he wrote the number by his boot as he said, 109, and I, he scratched another number. Keep 30. Sister Julia looked toward the girls with alarm. There was a large group on the left and a smaller group on the right. While she was washing, they had been divided. She knelt down in front of Mariano. No, she said. They are my girls. Let them go and keep me instead. Only Coney decides these things. Then let me speak with Coney. No one ever saw Coney. He was hidden over the border in Sudan. Maybe the government troops couldn't reach him there. Maybe, as some thought, President Museveni did not try so hard to find him. 
The North was not such a priority for Museveni, and neither was the LRA. There were government troops around, yes, but the LRA was not so important. Let the girls go and take me to Kony. You can ask him, he said, and shrugged. Did he mean it? You can write him a note. Captain Laguerre called, and a woman with a white shirt and ragged pink belt was sent to another hut to return eventually with a pencil and paper. Sister Julia leaned the paper on her knee and wrote, Dear Mr. Coney, please be so kind as to allow Captain Mariano Laguerre to release the girls of a bouquet. Yours in God, Sister Julia De Angelis. As she wrote each letter, she felt her heart sink down. Coney would never see this note. Now you go over and write the names of the girls there, he said. She looked at the smaller group of girls sitting in feathery shadows. Please, Mariano, she said. You do like this, or you will have none of the girls, said Captain Mariano Laguerre. She left the captain and went over to the girls sitting on the hard ground. She held the pencil and paper limply in her hand. The girls looked at her, each with meaning in her eyes. She bent down to speak. Girls, be good. But she couldn't finish her sentence. The girls started to cry. They understood everything. An order was shouted, and suddenly some rebels standing nearby were grabbing branches and hitting at the girls who were crying. One jumped on the back of Louise. She saw them slap Janet. Then the girls were quiet. Sister Julia didn't know what to do. Then it seemed as if they were all talking to her at once in low voices, whispering. No, not all. Some were just looking at her. Please, they were saying, sister, take me. Jessica said, I have been hurt. Another, my two brothers died in a car accident and my brother is sick. Charlotte said, sister, I have asthma. Sister, I am in my period. Sister Julia looked back at the captain standing with his arms crossed. He was shaking his head. She said she was supposed to write their names down, but she was unable. Louise, the captain of the football team, took the pencil from her and the paper and started to write. Akello, Esther. Ochiti, Agnes. Judith, Helen, Janet, Lily, Jessica, Charlotte, Louise, Jacqueline. She returned to the commander. Did I mistreat you, sister? No, sir. Did I mistreat the girls? No, sir. So next time I come to the school, do not run away, the captain laughed. Would the sister like more tea and biscuits? No, thank you. They bade each other goodbye. It was as if they might have been old friends. You may go greet them before you leave, Mariano Laguerre said. Sister Julia once again went over to the 30 girls, her 30 girls who would not be coming with her. She gave her rosary to Judith and said, look after them. She handed Jessica her own sweater out of the backpack. When you go, when we go, you must not look at us, she said. No, sister. We won't. Sister Julia had to make herself turn to leave. Helen called after her sister. You are coming back for us? Sister Julia left with the large group of girls. They walked away into the new freedom of the same low trees and scruffy grasses, which now had a new appearance, and left the 30 others behind. Bosco led the way, and Sister Julia walked in the middle. Some girls walked beside her and held her hand for a while. They bowed their heads when she passed near them. Arriving at a road, they turned onto it. The rebels stayed off the roads. It grew dark, and they kept walking. They came to a village that was familiar to some of them and stopped at two houses to spend the night. There were more than 50 girls to each house, so many lay outside sleeping close in one another's arms. Sister Julia felt she was awake all night, but then somehow her eyes were opening, and it was dawn. At 5 a.m., they fetched water and continued footing at home. As the birds started up, they saw they were closer to the school and found that word had been sent ahead and in little areas passed people who clapped as they went by. 
Sister Julia felt some happiness in the welcome, but inside there was distress. They came finally to their own road and at last to the school drive. Across the field, Sister Julia caught sight of the crowd of people near the gate. The parents were all there waiting. She saw the chapel blackened with soot behind the purple bougainvillea, but the tower above still standing. Many girls ran out to embrace their mothers who were hurrying to them. As she got close, Sister Julia saw the parents' faces watching, the parents looking for their daughters. They searched the crowd. There was Jessica's mother with her hand holding her throat. She saw Louise's mother, Grace, ducking side to side, studying the faces of the girls. The closer they got to the gate, the more the girls were engulfed by their families, and the more separated became the adults whose children were not there. The families held on to each other and kept their attention away from the parents whose girls had been left behind. They would not meet their gaze. In this way, the parents learned their children had not made it back. When they came near Sister Julia and all the commotion, she turned away from them. She was answering other questions. Some mothers were kneeling in front of her. Some kissed her hand. She was thinking, though, only of the other parents. And she would talk to them eventually. But just now it seemed impossible to face them. Then she wondered if she'd ever be able to face anyone again, ever. Thank you. Um, I think this is the only one that's working. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we can we can pass it. Thank you so much, Susan. That was um, an extraordinary reading, and I think uh, due to timing, we're actually going to open it up to audience questions sooner rather than later. But I did want to ask uh, one question to get us started. So. Uh, the opening um, of this novel is so gripping and so riveting, um, and to me, just like a like a flawless uh, opening uh, chapter. Um, and I was curious to know: Did you know from the beginning that that was going to be the opening of Thirty Girls, or did it take you a while to find that point of origin? Um, it actually wasn't, it seemed so obvious for it to be the beginning that um, I don't like to do the obvious thing, so it wasn't at the beginning at first. It was that part I just read to you. I, I had told Linda before that usually after I read that, no one ever, no one wants to talk very much, so I'm going to try to make you feel all spirited again, so you'll... <laughs> um, so it was the, that, that story of the ab abduction and with Sister Julia that opens the book. Um, since it, it is the incident that unites my two heroines, uh, Jane and Esther, um, I knew that it was going to be crucial in the book. And I originally had it about chapter three. So I introduced Jane, I introduced Esther, and then I had that. And then I realized that why well, beat around the bush? It's the, <laughs> it, it's the um, sort of galvanizing uh, event. Um, so I put it at the beginning. Thank you. And all your well thought out questions, you're, you don't want to ask me any of them? No, we've got some. Um, oh yeah, 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 no, it didn't have, um, I, I think this, uh, I, I have a very good relationship with, with my, um, publisher, which is Knopf, which is part of Random House, and I have a strong relationship with my editor, not that, that, uh, that, that helps. Um, and I, this, this book, like, um, like every book, certainly, that I write, it evolved from what it initially was going to be. And I think when um, I, I did get an advance on the book before I started it, and 
and as much as a description I gave was a love story set in Africa. <laughs> so it evolved from that. It, it, at that point I had envisioned a, a kind of triptych and there were three stories um, that had Africa, the continent, as their um, unifying principle. And one was a love story, and, and one was set in Uganda, and one was something, and then I realized that they, that wasn't enough of a unifying principle, and the story of the girls was, was the, the most compelling one. Could, could everyone hear the question? Um, do I realize, in the evolutionary process of writing a book, do, is, is, do I realize it myself, or do editors and agents and publishers have some input? Um, if only I did have more help, is what I can say. <laughs> I always feel like, and you see in the movies, um, either I have very gracious and kind of polite uh, agents and editors, or they, don't, they want to leave me alone or something, but in the movies, whenever you, you see someone on the phone saying, they're waiting for your book, and it's on the way, you know, if only, you know. <laughs> so, no, I, the, the, the way I work is, I'm not sure to get any input until I really have something that I have um, a handle on. It, it doesn't help to get any input before that. So, you know, maybe three years into this book, I, mm, no, it was probably about five years into it that I start, I showed some part of it to my editor. It's a lonely business in case if there are any writers out there. Yes. Hopefully, each one is. Well, I mean, the the the, the dinner was the 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 beginning of my um, learning about this story and about this phenomenon and about traveling to Africa and it was never at that point did I think I was going to write about it in a fictional way and it was only, you know, it was seven years later that I thought maybe I could write about this. Um, if, if anything, um, I, I definitely again was focusing on the female side of it and it's a lot about mothers and daughters um, this, there, there's a, a character in the book named Grace who's modeled a, a bit on, on Angelina and her fighting to, um, to have the girls brought back was, was um, very interesting to me. Uh, the book is dedicated to my daughter and to my two stepdaughters. So I was really keeping the daughter, female, mother, daughter th theme alive. Um, probably having a daughter made me think of that more. Um, but I would say that focusing on this subject was uh, harder to do. Like that was sort of against my maternal instinct, which is to be positive and <laughs> um, not focus on, on sort of, you know, things that, that really do, um, do sort of make you question humanity in some way. Yeah. I have another question. Um, you, so you mentioned earlier that the two central voices in the story are Esther and Jane and that they both know, they both know death, they both know loss. 
but in very, um, you know, but in, in very different contexts. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the, um, the challenges and just the process of writing uh, these two characters who are so fully, richly realized and, and their stories are paralleling each other, but they, you know, are in, in some ways occupying similar and very different uh, psychic spaces. Um, well, certainly the, the, the biggest hurdle um, with, was, was writing about Esther um, as a character who's gone through, you know, dire things that I certainly have not been through, um, who is from another country. Um, so there were, uh, that was, you know, that was the first four or five years I had to really convince myself that I was going to, you know, be able to, to pull it off. And um, again, I wrote a lot more about the history of Uganda in here. And I, there was much more that explained why Joseph Kony could come to power and the sort of tribal um, situation in the north and because those things were interesting and they help sort of explain kind of the phenomenon of of the LRA but um, number one I'm not very good writing about that probably because it's not as deeply interesting to me as sort of psychically what's going on inside a person and so I thought well I'll, I'll just try to focus on that and that's really what I I was exploring um, and I thought you know, well, Jane uh, Esther is, uh, you know, she's a 15-year-old girl, and I, too, once was a 15-year-old girl, and so I concentrated on what would be f familiar and what I shared with her more than what would be different. Of course, she had to you know, I wanted it to be realistic and the context she was in be like a, a, a world that someone who knew that part of the world would say, yeah, 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 this is what it's like and, and have her speak in, in the right way. Um, but I do think, I, I was saying something about this before, people say, um, and I think it's true, if you're in a war or you're in a famine or you're in a natural disaster, you are in a very extreme, um, challenging experience. But, and, and people will say, I, I just can't imagine. As a way of, it's, it's usually giving sort of respect to the extremity of someone's experience, but there's like a, a sort of flip side to it, which is sort of saying, and you're gonna be forever unconnected to me because of that. And I think we actually, as I said, are empathetic and can imagine. Um, we're empathetic creatures. Um, we have consciences and we feel things that are right and wrong. And, and I think that to keep someone at a distance who's been through something extreme is adding one more punishing dimension to their, their trauma. So not that you dismiss it, you respect it, but you don't let it keep you from it. So, so that's, that's how I found my way you know, in, into Esther. And then Jane, um, I did a different thing with Jane, which is, um, Again, I like to, you know, uh, not do the things that I see being done a lot in a book. You know, you don't want to do this, the same thing. And I also like to challenge things that irritate me. And um, while I love a good, strong female character in a book, and I can sort of feel like, God, oh, that's something I maybe can try to be like, uh, it irritates me that... Um, that a weakness in a female character is considered like not a good character because um, as far as I know we all have our weaknesses <laughs> and so I deliberately made Jane not some strident confident you know I, I mean I, I 
I wanted her to to be um, she's she's earnest and she's searching and she's trying but she has you know some flaws and she even sees herself you know she falls in love with this younger man that she's with and says this is ridiculous I shouldn't be doing it but doesn't sort of stop herself and and has you know that kind of struggle so I um, made her that way on purpose <laughs> I think we might have um, time for one or two more audience questions, if anyone has, a, has one. Have you gotten um, feedback? I mean, in essence, you're trying to um, help people tell their story, which is a part of grabbing the identity in the back. And so, yeah. Have you gotten feedback from people um, from some of these? I mean, from people in Uganda? Well, I wouldn't say they're exactly reading novels there. I mean, um, I've gotten feedback from people who uh, are familiar with Africa. Um, and I mean, they're probably not going to go out of their way to say, you did it very badly, so I'm hearing from the people that bother to say, you know, I think it, you've depicted it how it is, and you've you've you know focused on a, a certain kind of struggle going on there. Um, I just finished. This is not really answering your question, but but ho maybe it it will be answered. Because of this, I just finished writing the screenplay of 30 Girls, and um, the actress Rachel Weiss uh, optioned it, and she wants to play Jane, the imperfect character, because um, she likes how imperfect she is. Uh, and we have a Saudi Arabian director, a woman named Haifa Al Mansour, who's going to direct it. And so I, I have a feeling. If the movie gets made, there'll be, it's somehow movies are more public in terms of garnering reaction and stuff. So I, I hope I'll hear more. During the evolutionary process, and you feel unsettled, and is there a moment when you finally feel like you've got it, aha. Um, I would say most of it is unsettled. And there are little aha, you know, you can maybe finish a section and feel like, okay, this is going to stay this way. Um, a chapter, for instance, and so there's a little aha uh -huh there, you know. <laughs> but, and this is just the way I write, I, I will change things and then suddenly it may seem like, oh, that chapter's not going to be a part of the book anymore, really. And, and I, um, maybe by now, this was my seventh book, so by now I figured it's better to keep sort of evolving with it, like to stick with the sort of plan you had at the beginning. Um, you didn't, you couldn't envision it all then. So I would say, you know, evolving, evolving, it's an uncomfortable feeling, but usually, and I tell this to my students also, it's, it's that first, um, that first impulse draws you to the material but usually it's whatever you're saying on that first initial um, level is not going to be very thoughtful. Or at least it's not going to be, it's not going to have been as fathomed as what you're going to keep on thinking the more you explore something. And so if in the evolution of a book the material takes you to a different place, you, I think it's good to go there. But 
there's always a but, there's always the flip side, which is all work and no play can make Jack a dull boy, you know, the, the <laughs> you can be writing over the same, you can keep thinking, I'm going to change it and change it and change it, and then you, you never stop. So, there's no easy answer, <laughs> except that I think that the instinct that says, what do I, if I were picking up a book, what would I really want to read? Not what do I have to tell someone else, like what would I really like to hear about? I think that can be a good guide. Absolutely. I think sadly we are at time, so thank you so much and please join us for the book signing uh, in the lobby. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, I'm sorry we started late. Thank you.